I'm really grateful to be able to participate in these conversations, especially with an international group of people, group of researchers and museum workers. It's, um, it's a very important theme as, at this point in time in, in, in our museum. So I hope that the, uh, the stories I share with you today will, will find some relevance um, for you all. This seashell was collected on one of the atolls of Tokelau in the 1990s and gifted to the museum in 2006 by a Tokelauan man called Kupa Kupa. Now, Tokelau is a group of atolls a few thousand miles north of New Zealand. Now, we don't have a collection of unmodified shells in the Pacific culture story at Papa. We have shell cultural valuables, shell necklaces, trumpets, shell decorated shields and canoes, but no beautiful random shell collection. Yet this shell could probably be considered one of our, our, our most interesting acquisitions in recent years for how it tells the story of Pacific Islanders in New Zealand, their transnational ties, and how it speaks to the politics of co-collecting. But I'll come back to this shell at the end of my presentation. Now, as you know, my name is Sean Mallon, and I'm a Senior Curator of Pacific Cultures at the Museum of New Zealand Te Papa Tongarewa. That's the National Museum, so it's a bit different than most of the people here, um, a different kind of institution. It's about the history of the country of New Zealand, what it means to be a nation. And it covers um, history, Pacific cultures, Māori, the, the sciences, and of course art. Now I've worked there since 1992, um, where I joined the staff as a Pacific intern, but today my role is to look after the Pacific cultures collections, and I'm part of a small team that includes another curator, Nina Tonga, who is Tongan, and a collection manager, Grace Hutton, who is Cook Islander and Welsh, and I'm of Samoan and Irish descent. Now, some of you may not be aware that in New Zealand, Pacific Cultures collections are usually managed separately from Māori collections, recognising that Māori are the tangata whenua, or the first settlers of the land, and that Pacific Islanders are a very diverse group of cultures represented as, as coming much later on. The seven largest groups that we most often talk about when we talk about Pacific peoples in New Zealand are from Samoa, Tonga, the Cook Islands, Niue, Tokelau, Tahiti, which has just surpassed Kiribati and Tuvalu as having the most um, numerous um, people. And historically, the, um, historically in the National Museum, Pacific peoples were represented in the collections because we were foreigners. Our exoticism was what made us interesting in a subject of study. As Pacific populations have grown in New Zealand since the mid-20th century, the situation has changed. And since at least the late 1980s and 1990, early 1990s, is now a cultural proximity that rationalises our inclusion in the Museum of New Zealand. The conference, this conference and the invitation to speak here comes at a an important time for Te Papa. The museum is going through a period where there's a renewed emphasis on issues of collaboration, co-curating and sharing authority. And the, and the idea of co-collecting is a major part of the, this set of processes. Indeed, three weeks ago, we hosted the Federation of International Human Rights Museums conference, where the theme was access is a human right. And in this regard, and since the opening of Te Papa in 1997, one of our central philosophies has guided our work in this direction. And this has been the concept of mana tonga, which is a key concept for activating claims of authority and processes of agency. Now the principle of mana tonga affirms that the spiritual and cultural connections of the people to whom taonga or cultural treasures belong are acknowledged at Te Papa. In a practical sense, this accords rights to those people with such connections to participate in the care of their tongue or cultural treasures and to speak about them and determine how they are displayed or used by Te Papa. And this is um, one of the statements that circulates at the moment in the organisation. So Mana Tonga formally activates a sharing of authority with our communities and provides a mechanism for agency. However, the politics of agency and authority are threaded through and key to the daily tasks of collecting artefacts, writing labels, cataloguing, exhibiting, hosting tour groups, assisting researchers, writing blogs, writing articles, 
putting together books and even paste, uh, posting on Facebook. Reflecting on agency and, and my role as a curator of Pacific Islands' descent and the role of the communities I work with, I see co-collecting as a significant extension of this principle or this concept of mana taonga that has been happening right under our noses, if not under bright lights, for quite a while. In some ways, co-collecting is a difficult term for me personally because I think it masks some of the dynamics and some of the things that are at stake and activity that in practice appears to be an equal relationship. Co-collecting? Now, I can't really be precise about what co-collecting is, but in this talk, I think I can sketch for you some of its dimensions, highlighting where issues of authority and agency can arise. And I hope that these observations will be useful for the deliberations of this workshop. Now, of course, most of the impetus and activity relating to collecting comes from us as curators. It's part of our job, it's what we do every day, looking at auction catalogues, visiting exhibitions, visiting artists, monitoring online auction sites, dealer galleries, all the usual marketplaces where material culture circulates through. But we actually have a long history of activity that we could consider co-collecting, where Pacific people have decided to donate or sell items to the museum. Now, this may not seem such a big deal in terms of our institutional history. I mean, people have always been donating things to museums for decades. But for Pacific peoples, this type of engagement, engagement with the museum feels somewhat new and conspicuous because of its now increasing regularity. In his book, Exhibiting Māori, um, my friend and colleague, Colin McCarthy from Victoria University, drew our attention to the long history of Māori involvement in museums and exhibitions, highlighting their agency and manoeuvring within the museum institution. Since the 1990s, Pacific peoples have had a similar history in their dealings with Te Papa, engaging and using the museum as a resource for their own social and cultural requirements, and sometimes in ways we're not fully aware of. There are a couple of big picture reasons for this, and, and firstly, it's probably the growing population of Pacific peoples in New Zealand. Um, secondly, their visibility in New Zealand's cultural landscape. And thirdly, the fact that Te Papa exists as a cultural product um, that you know, has a big place on, in our environment. And perhaps even in a small way, um, I think I can claim our own work and our own presence as Pacific staff, as agents for growing networks and for undertaking certain types of activity. So how do we collect? Now, historically, or how do we co-collect? Hold on, sorry. I just got to put in um, the right slide list off my pen drive. I'm just trying to keep calm. Actually, um, but you can see in this um, slide. Some of you may have seen it before. All the um, the range of objects we we collect. And a lot of them have been collected perhaps in the last decade or so. Here's another um, example of an object that some of you will have seen before. Now, put this up because I'm talking about, just to take us back to where I was, how do we co-collect? Now, historically, it's been through formal advisory groups that have been associated with exhibitions and different kinds of work at the museum. When I think back over our work, one of the earliest examples of a Pacific person coming forward and making some kind of statement of what he felt should be collected was the Reverend Langi Sapali. Now, um, he came out and gave us this paint and drum from Niue, known as a Palau. And back in, in 1995 or six, or whenever it came in, I was, um, you know, I was new to the museum, I'd only been there since 92, and to see something like this presented was a real oddity, hard to deal with, you know, it's a painting. It's not the most beautiful thing, but um, how could I say no to, um, how could I say no to the Nguyen representative of our advisory group, who also happened to be a pastor? 
and he really looked smart, and he was one of the great guys. He had a big white beard, great beard. So, you know, this, you know, this knowledgeable man had presented this to me as part of the, um, to be in the collections. How could I say no? So um, it eventually um, made it into the exhibition. And, um, you know, part of it, I think, was that uh, there's a certain obligation for us to say yes. Because if we didn't say yes, we'd question this person who we appointed to the advisory group. We'd question their credibility as a community representative. We'd question their cultural authority. When I took exhibition tours of the museum, when it first opened in 97, some people would balk when they saw this drum. Um, but, they, but when they heard it was donated by a New Am pastor on an advisory group, there'd often be silence. You know, the authority of cultural advisors is probably the pathway most people would take in museums, um, and it certainly has been a key entry point for us. And um, there have been many examples, and uh, I mean, I think in this particular group, um, what I learned from them was that co-collecting can enhance the status of the people we work with as much as it enhances our, our status as an institution. And it's something that they take seriously because it is their role as an advisory committee member. Another approach we've um, taken to co-collecting of a kind is by being consultative in the acquisition process. Now this work is the work of Joseph Churchwood, who is a Samoan, and he, is he was world famous as a typeface designer, except in New Zealand. So um, we had um, heard of him and we approached him about um, collecting some of his work for the, for the museum. And he'd won some international awards, his work is part of a typography museum in Germany, but he had very little profile in New Zealand. So when we went to see him, he, he was like your, um, your master genius, artist guy, you know, he had an amazing studio, he had piles of work from years gone by all around him. And um, we could have chosen any group of, um, we could have choos chosen all the work. We chose several hundred examples of his work. But what happened was um, he wanted us to pick works that represented his family background. So that you see a piece there called Churchwood Marisha, and it was named after his daughter. And Churchwood Mariana, named after his other daughter. And then that piece there, the Samoan alphabet, he even had a Chinese alphabet. He had different alphabets depending on his cultural background because he was from a mixed cultural background. But he also wanted to honour his family members, so he named different alphabets after different um, members of his family. So we collected the, the, um, the selection we made was largely based on what he wanted. So he had a big say in that. And when we did the, a small exhibition of his work, somebody wrote to the CEO of the museum complaining that it was a terrible exhibition, poorly curated, there were no serifs, there were no this, that, gone through the whole thing. And so the CEO at the time said, Sean, could you please write a response to this letter for me? So I drafted it up and we were able to explain that it, the collection was co-developed co and the exhibition reflected that long process. And that that aspect of it was actually in the exhibition, but the person was probably too angry to notice. Another form of co-collecting in the past has been through donation. Now, um, you might be wondering what those shoes are doing there. We, um, we had an open day a few months ago where people were on tour through the back of House of Papa. And I put the shoes out on the table because I sort of knew they'd get a response from visitors and would be a talking point, um, if not a milestone in their visit. And um, I remember some guy coming around saying, are those Captain Cook's shoes? And I went, oh, yes, they are, in fact. And then everyone came around because they got excited. And I just said, no, 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 these shoes here, why are they here? And I used them to tell us the story of, um, well, I was able to tell the story of how, at the end of last year, I got a phone call um, from a guy who said, hey, I'm, my name is um, Vasata Sele. I've just, a few months ago, I walked the length of New Zealand raising money for charity. And I think I might be the first Pacific Islander, if not the first Samoan, to walk the length of New Zealand. Do you want my shoes? And I said, <laughs> okay, <laughs> hold on a minute. So we had a talk about it, and I said, can you please send me an email 
show me what the shoes look like and give me some backstory. And while he did that, I did some research myself and found out he could well be the first um, one Pacific person to walk the length of the country. And that's the actual slide that he sent me attached to his email. There's a whole bunch of them. So we ended up getting the shoes, and part of the argument I made um, around the acquisition committee table was I was saying, this guy just offered them to me. I mean, what do you guys think? But everyone thought, well, there's been a phenomenon in New Zealand over the last decade of people walking the length of the country to raise money for charity. Why not tell that story through a Samoan person's shoes? It's the first set that we've been offered. So, you know, they won't make it probably into any um, exhibition of Pacific art, <laughs> but they do tell a social history story and, a, and through a Samoan's experience. So we accepted the donation, they're part of the collection, and they... they um, who knows how they might find use in the future, what stories they could tell. Another um, interesting story was, uh, relates to this set of toki, which, is also from toko, which are also from Tokelau. And they... Um, now they, we were approached in the 1990s when we were developing the new museum. A guy came up to me and said, hey, we, I'm in the middle of making... He came to the museum to see me. And he said, we're in the middle of making some ads, and I just wanted to know if you wanted them for the museum. We're sort of halfway through the process. I said, oh, really? And he says, yeah. And I said, well, why don't I come out to Paru and see what you're doing? So I went out to his hometown, and he and his cousin, who's sitting near the two younger guys, they had initiated this process of making ads with their grandfather. And part of the process was that they felt that as young Tokelauans who'd come to New Zealand and settle down, that they couldn't get access to a lot of the information that their elders had. Life ways, um, stories, folklore, um, how to fish, do different things. So they moulded over for a long time and they came up with this process of, hey, let's learn to make some ads. And their grandfather, being a noted tofunga or expert, engaged in the process and started showing them how to make these ads. And you can see that they just got started and you could, you could see the rough halves there. But what, turned, what happened in the process of them making the ads is, was that all kinds of things would come up in conversation. When's the best time to fish on the reef? Where do you find fresh water on an atoll? What's the story about Uncle So-and-so? Why do you do this this way? How do you do that that way? You know, where do you get these materials? So through the process of making these things, they were able to heal some of the, the fragmented, um, or the heal or bridge the distance between a life way they could only remember as young kids or they could imagine and reconcile it with their present, which is living in a suburb in Parirua where you have a very different way of life. So we were able to document that project for them, and those ads are strangely enough never actually carved wood. But I guess in a sense they carved a sense of identity for these young guys, which was really amazing. And they went on to co-author with me in... Um, in a journal, an article about that whole experience, and then they appeared on a small television show which featured collection stories from Tapapa. And if we've got time at the end, I might show you it. It's about three minutes long. But that was another unsolicited attempt, but we were able to spin it out into multiple outputs so that we could share the authority around the object. But good on them for coming to us and picking us. And why did they do that? These are some uros. Another approach to co-collecting we've had is by working jointly with researchers out on the, in the field. These are from Pohnpei in, in Micronesia, and we were fortunate to get to know um, a young woman who's a PhD student um, of my wife, actually, and she had, was going to do her fieldwork in Pohnpei. So what we did was um, we asked her to collect on our behalf, and it shows you the way in which co-collecting can be done <laughs> by remote saving you a bit of money, taking advantage of networks, honouring artists and art forms, in this case, women's art, and um, recognising them. Now, for us to activate this type of activity ourselves as a curatorial team would have been expensive. I mean, how would we build those networks? How would we develop the language fluency and trust between us and artists? It would have taken us a decade and thousands of dollars of travelling back and forth. Now, this this all might seem very obvious, and all of us would love to do field work in a warm and tropical place, but what is the cost? You know, and do we always have to be the hero in these processes with our pith helmet and our notebook? Another example of this joint collecting was um, 
a 20-year archive of one of the major theatre companies in New Zealand called Pacific Underground, who produced numerous um, plays about Pacific Islanders' experiences in New Zealand. This one, fresh off the boat, reflecting on the migration stories of um, Pacific people who'd come since the 1950s. Now, um, this archive lived in a garage in Christchurch, and after the big earthquake in Christchurch, I'm not sure if you remember that, um, that property came, became, came under threat. And so this was a, a sort of disaster recovery project. But the, the, the self-appointed archivist, well, not self-appointed, the, the person who took responsibility in the theatre company for bringing this archive together made a selection, packaged it a lot beautifully, and um, presented us with what they thought was worth saving from their 20 years of activity. Incredibly rich, ephemera, ticket butts, minute meetings, photographs, but the names and makers of every piece of that ephemera. And by the time I've got through trying to catalogue it and understand it and create a record for every single person, in my mind I had this map of the incredible history of collaboration around this theatre company over 20 years. Graphic designers, publishers, publicists, journos. How do you recover that? It was fantastic to be able to um, bring that to the table. Networks. Um, now, the West Papua movement is really big in New Zealand, and a lot of the, the, the free West Papua movement, and a lot of the work is visible online, um, particularly through Facebook. And through Facebook, we were able to contact the makers of this um, rugby league jersey associated with a competition that was going to be played in Port Moresby. And we were able to contact um, the makers, and it turned out the, the, the contact we made was I'm the captain of the team. He said, sure, we'll, give, we'll send you a jersey and we're all going to sign it as well. So through social media, we were able to, um, to activate that. Now, activate that, that process. Now, is it co-collecting? I'm not sure, but um, we were able to use our networks to further a cause. Um, so the people that we knew that were in the West Papua sort of support group locally we were able to circulate the information we required and new stuff as well. So one of them, we're collecting like West Papua rings, other ephemera that are all associated uh, through this group. But the, the word sort of came to us rather than us proactively going out and finding it. Are you interested in this jersey? Have a look at it. Bang, I have a look, send it on to the next person. You know, there's, there's a real process there that's um, collaborative and sort of just spirals out. And social I know there's somebody going to talk about social media later, so I can't go into it. I won't go into it in much detail here, but um, it's a significant field site for us at Papa. Um, a number of people I deal with regularly, artists, tattooists, um, other sort of cultural producers, don't answer email anymore. Um, communications by SMS or by Facebook messaging. You know, you just can't get a reply unless you're active on those networks and moving around them as if you were in the community on, on your feet. And I think that long term, the success of co-collecting for us, we built on our relationships and network by being out there and on there. And by that I mean social media. And it's, it's a struggle to be present and active in this way when you've got your own personal social media accounts. But maybe we need to look at being more targeted in future. So why co-collect? Now I think co-collecting is a spearhead activity that can have really rich flow on effects. Co-collecting brings authority, ethnographic detail, nuance. It helps us understand the connections and disjunctures between the meanings of things in one place or time with those in another. Potentially, co-collecting will allow us to develop for collections, develop collections that will represent a wider spectrum of society. It allows us to represent a diverse range of artists, their careers, their works, their styles, interpretations and techniques allows us to be more inclusive and acquire the work of people and groups outside the often overrepresented social and cultural elites. Co-collecting improves our documentation. It lets us record names, places, even dates of birth that I think for too long have been absent in our ethnographic collections, but, but which, which are so valuable as building blocks in the recording and writing of future histories. Co-collecting means better relationships, and it's a way of activating meaningful engagement. I mean, meaningful relationships need projects to bring them to life and to sustain them. 
It's one thing to meet with the community every month or once a quarter, but another thing to make the relationship a meaningful one, especially over the long term. Co-collecting is, you know, there's, there's sort of economic and financial drivers for it. It's probably cheaper than sending curators everywhere. Um, there are people out there who've spent decades of their lives wearing and possibly making those dad's costumes that you saw online or that you saw at the arts festival. We should use them, work with them, collaborate. Now, co-collecting also presents challenges, and especially for the role of curators. I mean, as I've said, at the heart of cloak collecting are the relationships between us and the community. And in a museum such as Te Papa, where we are at such close, prox at such close physical proximity, not to mention digital proximity, it's really difficult for us as curators to maintain a role as you know, a curator of the ivory tower variety, the all-knowing the all connoisseur. I mean, that, this may be possible in other institutions where proximity and levels of engagement are different, or priorities are different, but for us, it's, um, it's very difficult. Co-collecting, I think, decenters us, makes us less the focus of attention. But, you know, don't get me wrong, I mean, I, th I believe in what we do as curators. We still need curators for their discipline, their knowledge of research methods, their critique, their rigour, um, their bird's eye view. And as much as it's about being close to the community, it's also about being able to find times when you need to maintain a distance. Why do communities want to collect? I haven't done the research, but you know, just speculating, I think the museum legitimizes them amongst all the other Pacific cultures. Um, you know, for the last decade or so, in, the muse in another part of the museum, there's a community gallery that has featured the Italian community in New Zealand, the Chinese, the Indians, the Scots, and currently houses an exhibition on the history of recent refugees to New Zealand called The Mixing Room. But for that gallery, there's a short but noisy queue of communities who want to be on display. I mean, they just want their turn. They want to know why they're not represented in the museum and when will they be. The sari and Fijian Masi dress um, came out of a, uh, an attempt for us to work with the Fiji Indian community, who was one of the communities who felt they weren't represented well in the museum. And we had a... Um, we had a, a workshop with them at, and uh, talked about what the museum means, what a collection could look like. But it really fell very flat. And um, I think people struggled to figure out how the, the social history of the Fiji Indian community in New Zealand in particular could be represented in a meaningful way in the museum. We tried photo thinking about photographs. We talked about the, um, the local businesses, how we could represent them somehow. And in the end, we um, collected a stethoscope from one of the, um, the fathers of one of the older members of the group who'd come to New Zealand and worked as a doctor. And we also were able to collect this dress from Nirmala Balram, who's um, a staff member and who was involved in the group in a big way. But it was a bit of a struggle there to get that started. Now, this is um, another example of a co-collecting project where the community came to us with this garment, which um, this was collected in the 1990s, but they sort of set the terms. They asked us to put on a special event, and it was presented to the museum on the Marae. So they really took control, set the protocols, really um, dictated how they wanted to be received and, um, and celebrated for their work. Now, the Pacific Sisters are a collective of Māori and Pacific Island women who've worked for many years. I mean, Nicholas Thomas has a long history working with members of that group as well. But they've done some great work in museums and have really taken charge. Co-collecting has its limits. I think that we've got to be realistic about what co-collecting means. If it's to be part of our strategy of increasing collaboration and honouring the principle of mana tonga, we need to understand that it has its limits. It will never be a full partnership, but it will be a partnership, actually, but it will be an unequal one. In terms of institutional time and resource, we must acknowledge that we still hold the power, the purse strings, the yes or no when it comes to storage, space and access. Co-collecting highlights the challenge of dealing with processes of globalisation and transnationalism. Both these processes impact our curatorial work, and we're really pushed to try and look for the connections between New Zealand and the other Pacific Islands, and take note that cultural flows go both ways, or in multiple ways. 
The movement of people has made it more difficult to pin society down, societies down and cultures down to one specific location. As other scholars have pointed out, we can no longer look at nations as spots on the map. Try and do that for Tonga. When Tonga's, Tonga, Tonga culture is expressed in Auckland, Los Angeles, Anchorage or Tokyo, many of the cultures and community we work with are transnational and maintain active family, cultural and economic ties across national boundaries. As much as people are traveling and, and moving, so too is their material culture. Admittedly at different intensities and different rates, but this has implications for the standard methods we use for developing and documenting collections and interpreting in display. Uh, interpreting them in displays. When it comes to material culture and its significance, an object's cultural distinctiveness within the global environment may, they, may not always be apparent. Now, you know Bruce Lee is Samoan, right? Bruce is my oos. You see him holding that jandal? This is just an example of what I'm talking about, what we need to look out for, and why code collaboration and knowing your community is very important. Now, oos is the slang term for someone, person, you know, what up, oos, brother. This is taken off the, uh, the website. And um, you can see how they've indigenized Bruce Lee to make him a little bit more Samoan. <laughs> and this all speaks to the, the environment that we're in. Now, what's at stake in all of this? I think the bottom line is that the relevance of our museum to the communities we, we serve is, that, is what is at stake. <laughs> the history of the present for the future is what's at stake. The museum is a social and cultural resource that our various communities put to work in all kinds of ways, from who is consulted, who is invited, who is performing, who gets a car park voucher and who is the authority. Like the church choir, the sports team, the office, co-collecting will bring us closer to our communities, but it also has its politics. We will be asked, why are you collecting them and not us? Who said you should collect that and not this? I mean, Pacific peoples often exercise agency in the machinery of the museum where they might feel they are resisting, but they can also be agents for the museum in its renewal, its transformation and growth. Now, there are real precedents out there for formal collecting in the Pacific, or formal co-collecting in the Pacific, and some of you may be aware of the Vanuatu Field Workers Program, which ran a, a while back. I think it's still active. Um, and that's, that's a precedent that's inspired us to try and think about how we could tap into a similar network for the development of um, our own collecting. So this, is, this mask here was collected for Culture Moves, and our curator, Kolokesa Mahina Tuai, contacted the Vanuatu Cultural Centre, who activated their field worker in Malikula, and the field worker collected the mask, a full costume, and some film footage of the men performing the ritual. So there was a lot of timing involved, but you can see we collected it in 2005, the same year the show opened. So there's a, a network that we were able to just like make happen. Took some good people in Vanuatu too, but you know, that's the potential. We see our future prospects in co-collecting along similar lines. This is a Tongan group of students on the left, Tongan language students from a high school in Auckland, and on the right, a, a group of Hawaiian um, students from Midpac. Now they came to Tapapa and my colleague Nina Tonga put them through a very simple short exercise saying, you've been on a tour of our collections, write down 10 things that you think we should collect. So the Tongan group were talking about the different types of garments that they grew up with to wear to church. You know, most ethnographic collections will go for the fancy part of the garment, maybe not the whole garment. They were telling us you've got to get this one and this one and this one, get the whole range. And the mid-pack group were saying, you should collect license plates from Hawaii. You should collect you know, surfboards. They were giving us really good examples of things they would collect. Now, that was just a teaser to get us thinking. And um, it's something that we're very excited about. I mean, ultimately, I think people will come to us if we do our work well, but we have to educate them about what a museum can be and build a good reputation around our practice. And just to finish, I want to go back to that shell. Now this shell was given to me at the opening of a major exhibition at Te Papa. And the guy who gave it to me just, just said here, this is on behalf of the, our community. And this particular community had been very difficult to engage with. They wouldn't come to any of our development meetings. They wouldn't let us go and visit them. We offered to pay for their transport, take taxis out to see them. 
So on the opening, they had no representative, but this guy showed up because he knew us quite well. And um, he just came out and said, oh, this is on behalf of my community for the museum. And I said, oh, that's, that's great. And he goes, it's, it's, it's from my island. That's what I brought when I came to New Zealand. And um, so it sat on the shelf for a long, long time. And I wasn't sure about whether to collect it because we didn't have a shell collection. And then I wrote to him and said, what's the story of that shell again? Because I've got to deal with it. <laughs> I've got to deal with it in terms of our cataloging and bureaucracy. And he said to me, he goes, when I, was, I went to Tokelau after being in New Zealand for a while, I went back there as a teenager, and we spent a few months there, and then it was time for us to go, and I realised I might never make it back to Tokelau. And he said as he was getting ready to go on the boat, he just looked around to see what he could grab to make him remember home. And he grabbed a shell and put it in his pocket, and he came back to New Zealand. And he said, and I've had that ever since. And he presented it to us in his 30s, and he said, this is how I remember Tokelau. I said, wow. You've told it to me before. You know, I sort of got a bit of a chill when he told me. And, you know, when I said at the beginning, this is a story about transnationalism. It's a story about being a Pacific Islander in New Zealand. But it's also a co-collecting story. Because he came to us and thought, there's a good place for this, the shell instead of my drawer. It should be on a shelf at Papa and on a catalogue where people can see it and read the story. So, I mean, just to finish, my last statement would be that co-collecting means we have to get closer to our communities. It means that sometimes we'll have to take the lead and sometimes we'll have to look or listen. Co-collecting means sharing and reworking one aspect of our curatorial role and letting go. Now, I don't think we should feel threatened by this because in decentering ourselves, we might actually recenter our institutions as places that are relevant to the communities we represent. If we are committed to history, material cultures, and the people that make them, then a co-collected, co-curated future must surely be something to get excited about. Thanks for listening.